three, we've been studying, uh, uh, doing a survey of Genesis one and two the last couple of weeks. By way of introduction, Genesis was uh, written by Moses. He's the author of the first five books of the Bible. Um, like every book, and it's not just the book of Genesis that challenges us as it regards the, the subject of the authority of God's word. Um, every, book of, every book of the Bible uh, asks of us the question, how are we gonna treat God's word? Are we gonna take it at face value? Are we going to purpose with the help of the Holy Spirit to change the way we think and behave? Uh, will we take God's word as truth declared to us? And Genesis challenges us with that, but so does Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Matthew and Mark. You pick a book of the Bible, and it's always asking us, what are you going to do with God's word? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to, are you going to act and be a doer of the word? Are you going to take it at face value? And that's what the book of Genesis does. And it, one of the, the neat things is, is Genesis tells us how we got here. Um, over six literal days, the scriptures tell us that God made the earth. And he made it, and he took six days for our benefit. Um, God could have just said, let it all be. But that we might have a pattern for our very work week and our worship and our, and our time of worship. God took six days. Um, and here we are uh, together worshiping Christ. Uh, we worship on we worship on the uh, actually the first day of the week because that's the day Jesus rose. Uh, but we see the pattern given for us in Scripture of work followed by rest and the worship of God. Um, Genesis uh, one and two emphasizes the goodness of God, and we're going to see today in Genesis chapter three that we have an enemy named Satan who likes to whisper in our ear that God is not good. And yet, over and over again, particularly in Genesis chapter 1, it speaks about, and, it was, and it, God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. If, if God's declaring something good, that's coming from a good God, a perfect God, a holy God. Uh, and we have to hold on to that and remember that God is good, God is holy. Genesis 1 and 2, like all of God's word, also points to Christ. In a variety of different ways, we've already seen through Genesis 1 and 2 uh, the, the, uh, the clear indicators that behind it all is Jesus, and it's pointing to Jesus. When we think about the worst, and I, I like that, I like this little worst day ever. We've heard people use that phrase, haven't we? <laughs> Had a bad day, worst day ever. <laughs> well, um, it actually, any of our worst days pale according to this day. When we think about worst day ever, Genesis 3 is the worst day ever. It's the day of, of when the man and the woman rebelled against God and brought on themselves the punishment of death. The, well, the best day ever, is, and the best weekend ever, is when Jesus died on the cross and took the punishment that we deserve and then he rose again. That's the best day and weekend ever, and, it, and it's the counter to the worst day ever. But first, uh, when we think about Genesis, and I have a slide, uh, go ahead, Scott. Uh, Genesis 3 answers for us a very fundamental question. Genesis answers all the big questions of life. Where did I come from? Genesis 1 and 2 talks about God making us and how we're the pinnacle of God's creation, made in his image, which makes life incredibly precious, human life incredibly precious. Uh, and here in Genesis 3, we have an answer for why the world is so messed up. What's the so what is behind the world being the disaster that it is? And so when I have a long list, why is the world one giant graveyard? Why is there deserts and barren land? Why is there thorns and thistles and mosquitoes and wasps? Why is there murder, assault, theft, jails, mental health problems, disabilities of every kind, racism, war, plague, disease, hatred, poverty, divorce, jealousy, bitterness, anger, alcoholism, um, tyrants, hurricanes, typhoons, earthquakes, name the sin, name the problem. Genesis 3 answers why to all of them. And the answer is one actually we don't, we don't find terribly palatable. Um, the answer to it all is it's us. We're, we're the reason that everything is so messed up. Remember what does Genesis 1 say? God's good, God's holy, God's perfect. Everything he made was right. And then he said, and then God put, that, put the man and the woman in the garden. And he said, you can do anything you want except one thing. And I find that pretty amazing. God says you can do anything you want except there's one 
one thing you can't do. And if you do that thing, uh, you will bring death into the world, and you will die. Uh, it sounds so over the top. It's almost surreal. You're like, what do you mean you're going to break that one thing? It seems so trivial. And yet it really challenges us to think about a holy God and what it means to follow God and to, and to see uh, what obedience is really all about. But Genesis 3, it answers the question, why is the world so messed up? And the answer is one that we find hard, but it's the, it is the answer. We're the reason the world is messed up. And all of those things that we listed, that's all on us. Um, and, and so it makes us desperately needy. And maybe it helps us see just how, how sinful we actually really are and how much in need we are of Christ and his grace. And that's the amazing thing, is that worst day ever is actually counted by best weekend ever in history when Jesus dies on a cross uh, and takes this, the punishment and sin that we deserve, that we can have eternal life and forgiveness with God and be reconciled to him. Um, the, the other thing that we see, just as an introduction before we read, is uh, Genesis 3 introduces us to uh, our enemy. A new character is introduced in Genesis 3. Um, and, and, and the devil is... is um, comes to us in the form of a serpent, it says. I found this very interesting picture. Um, Gustave Doré, uh, some of these artists from the middle centuries are pretty wild in their artistic depictions, um, and some of it's quite disturbing. But uh, Gustave Doré made this picture, called, and it's from uh, Paradise Lost, the book called Paradise Lost. And it says, Satan contemplates a serpent. Uh, and so we... In, in Genesis 3, uh, Satan is introduced to us as a serpent. There's a talking snake, an enemy of God who specializes in lies and deception and who is called, said to be crafty. Um, there's some other books, and if you want to learn a bit more about our enemy, um, in, in, in Ezekiel chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28, almost whole chapters that that speak about Satan and his purposes and the evil in his heart and how he, in his involvement in trying to destroy us. Then if you read Revelation chapter 12, um, it as a whole, it speaks about Satan's rebellion in heaven. Satan is actually uh, a fallen angel. An, a an angel who led a rebellion in heaven and it says in the scriptures that a third of the angels rebel against God. And God cast them out of heaven onto earth, which begs the question, why? <laughs> um, but the, but uh, here is, and, and, and he's spoken of in Revelation 12 as that the great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil. So when we, we let scripture, one of the principles of reading the Bible is let scripture interpret scripture. So don't just, we don't fill in the blanks our own. We say, when I read God's word as a whole, do I have clues about the meaning of a verse or the meaning of the identity of someone or something? And so this serpent in Revelation and Isaiah and Ezekiel, it's a, and this, this one is identified as Satan, otherwise called the devil. It says in Revelation 12, 9, who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and the angels with him. Um, and so when I think about Genesis 3, whether Satan was masquerading as an angel, possessed a snake, or was a snake, I don't know. Um, it just says he appeared in this fashion. Um, he gets into the garden, he finds a target, and he does what he always does. He deceives and seeks to kill and destroy. Um, and, however, the good news is, Satan is a defeated foe. That's what the cross is about. That's... His defeat is spoken of um, in prophetic form in Genesis 3 as well, and we'll get to that. So that's just a little bit of an introduction. So let's have a look. We're going to read Genesis 3, then we've got a few principles I just want to lay out before you. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals, or actually another phrase there is just beasts or animals that the Lord God had made. And so he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, remember at this point, Adam and Eve don't have proper names. They're just referred to as man and woman at this point. 
Um, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat, free, not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. That's actually her addition at this point. God said you can't eat it. She throws in, we also can't touch it. But there's no indication otherwise of whether or not they could touch it or not. Then the devil says, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. <coughs> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God from, from among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, Well, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. And then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And so the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Verse 15 is quite an important verse in terms of relating to Christ. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. This is actually about conflict and marriage and power struggle. Um, it doesn't mean that your wife thinks you're hot all the time. <laughs> it's about a power struggle. <laughs> um, to the Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, though through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And then there's a postscript that says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. And the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, which is an angel from the presence of the Lord, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So there's a number of lessons. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to just walk you through some of the applications that are in the passage. Uh, the first one is, is Satan has a knack uh, for making rebellion and disobedience against God seem trivial and even a good thing. That's what that's the bill of goods that he sells to the woman. Um, did God really say, is, you know, is God really going to put a death penalty on you for eating something that seems so small, so, so, so pointless? Why is God holding something back from you? Uh, that's what Satan does. He, he wants us not to realize the gravity and seriousness of our disobedience. And so he makes it look small. He makes it look trivial. You and I wrestle with this all the time. That's not that bad a thing. It's only a, it's a small lie. It's only a little act. It's not a big deal. That's, that's the work of Satan. And it's, but it, we always need to be looking at things in relation to God. God is holy and perfect. He says, you are to be holy. Here's my standards for you. Take 
holiness as a serious thing. Take sin and rebellion as a serious thing. And one of the things that happens as you and I grow in our walk with Christ, we come to realize how bad we are the further along we go in Christ, don't we? The moment we come to, come to Christ, we're convicted of our sin. We ask for forgiveness. We know we've sinned against a holy God. We're, we're so grateful that there's an opportunity to be reconciled to him. But as you and I grow in our walk with Jesus, we come to realize, you know what? My attitude is a terrible thing. Or that, little, that one thing that I did that I used to consider not a big deal, now I realize it's a big deal. Because I see it against the backdrop of the holiness of Christ. I have a greater understanding about sin and righteousness. That's part of growing in our maturity. And what is Satan trying to do? He's try he tries to minimize, um, minimize the commands of God. Uh, we, we also have, there's an interesting verse from Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. What is our culture doing right now? It's trying to flip everything on its head and saying, and, and the net effect is, is things that you and I say from the scriptures are wrong in the sight of God. Our culture is saying, let's celebrate it. This is the right thing. Do this. It's actually, and then, and then the mockery is directed our way as ones who are somehow trapped in some time warp in the past uh, and, and however people want to depict it. But, but the Bible says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who are flipping God's holy, righteous standards. And so there is a, we need to recognize that Satan, he, he wraps up what is wrong in packages that look so right. And we have to always say, how am I supposed to live as a follower of Christ? And for you and I to have a sense of, that's actually quite a serious thing to go against God. The, the greater we have that sense, the better it is for us in our walk with him. Another point that, that's in the passage is Satan likes to put into people's hearts and minds the thought that God is not good and that somehow God doesn't have your best interests in mind. That's, that's, that's what Satan does. And so how many times have you and I had the thought, if God were so good, why did X or Y happen to me or happen to my friend or happen over there? Uh, what is one of the common <coughs> objections people use when they're trying to engage us and we're like, God's good, and they're like, well, if God's so good, why did 2,000 people just die in a tsunami? Uh, if God's so good, why did my grandmother get cancer? If God's so good, why did my friend get shot? But we've already established who's responsible for all the problems in the world? It's us. But what does Satan do? He says, no, it's actually God's fault. Um, it's not your fault at all. That's how Satan works. He, he, he finger pointed, remember the whole, when God confronts Adam and Eve, what are they doing? Placing blame, placing blame, placing blame. When you put the blame on everyone else, that means I'm off scot-free. And, and the Bible says, we are the problem. God is good. God's holy. Uh, we have an enemy who is, who is evil who was out to destroy us. The, Satan is the father of lies. He's a, he was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Jesus came that we might have life. Uh, and, yet, and yet Satan, he, he likes to plant in the, our, in the back of our head, maybe God's not as good as I've been taught. That, that lie, it, it sits in everyone's mind. Um, it doesn't matter, you look around, uh, you look around the room and you see all, all of us as Christians, Satan's always trying to put that back there. God's not as good as you think he is. And you and I have to say, have to realize what that is. That's a lie of Satan who wants to destroy us because he hates everybody. Um, number three, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry I'm going so fast, um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When we think about the point of the whole tree, why was the tree there? It's a test. You know, one of the one of the objections that people use is, you know, you know, if, if, what about the whole question of free will? And, and free will exists. You have freedom. Um, we're not robots. God says, "I want you to follow me willingly. Follow me from your hearts." Um, uh, our first parents, they had a choice to make: Am I going to obey God? And, and what's the backdrop is the most incredible backdrop of all is there's an entire world for them. And only, not a hundred restrictions, <coughs> not ten restrictions, one thing that God says, 
don't do it. And then to emphasize just how important the don't part was, God says there's a really, really big consequence that will come if you break this. And so it wasn't like spend 10 minutes in a timeout room to make to show how serious God is about holiness and righteousness. He says, if you do this, you'll die. Like it's your life is on the line for this one thing. And so that's a pretty big deterrent. And they just blew right by the deterrent and fell for Satan's lie that God was, was holding out on them and, and that, that this was a trivial matter. Uh, and, and yet, what is God doing? It's a, it's a test. Will I follow God willingly? Will I obey him from my heart? That, that still exists today, doesn't it? Um, there's still tests today. Am I going to follow God willingly? He want, that's what God desires from us. The neat thing is, as we learned in Genesis 2, in, uh, we're introduced to God's personal name, capital L-O-R-D, Yahweh. God calls us into relationship with him. But in that relationship, he wants us to be willing followers of him. Um, number four. Uh, for those of you who want a good marriage site, I left that, I usually clip people's names off of images. <laughs> I left it on there. Um, is a, actually a great marriage site. Uh, she's a blogger. So if you want a good marriage resource, check, check her out. Um, but here's one of the things that, that I noticed and you notice is, what is the issue? You know, it talks about um, the man, uh, God confronts them, and, and it says the man listened to his wife. It's not about the man listening to his wife. Husbands, you should listen to your wife. <laughs> take, but she's the only other person around. That's the real issue. Uh, and she listened to the serpent. She listened to Satan. He listened to her. Who's listening to God? That's the point, is who, who are you listening to? Um, and so we don't make it a, it's not a gender thing at all. It's actually, fundamentally, it's deeper. Both the man and the woman listen to someone other than the Lord. And I include the, cap, the personal name of God there. Why? Because they had a relationship with God. They didn't have a relationship with the devil. And yet the devil shows up and they listen to him instead, and they break their relationship with God. Uh, you and I today, whose voice are we listening to? You know, one of the things, one of the popular lies is, uh, it, it makes me cry inside, I'm just gonna follow my heart. No, no, you should never follow your heart. <laughs> never follow your heart, because the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Don't follow your heart. You're going to get hurt. Um, it, it's, uh, or I'm not, don't follow the expert on the TV. <laughs> what should we be doing? If God's voice is the most important voice to listen to, then the Bible and me got to be friends. I have to read it. I have to study it. I have to meditate on it. I have to learn it because that's God's word. What, what the fundamental issue is, they both listen to someone other than God. That's got them in huge trouble. They listen to Satan instead of God. Um, let's go on uh, number five. Um, the whole thing about blame shifting, uh, when it comes to our sin, denial, blame shifting, minimizing, that is our default reaction, isn't it? It's not just politicians who lie. <laughs> like, like we always like well no it's actually we tend to lie someone confronts you and you're like uh, I don't know if I was in the office that day <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is um, when confronted and it's something that we're kind of uncomfortable about we would feel shame about what's our what is our automatic response what's it me? I didn't do it I can't recall that's a clue for your guilty, right? <laughs> Never use the phrase, I can't recall, because it really means you do remember, and you're just trying to get, we know that's true, don't we? Um, but the, what is, that is how we typically respond. We, we make things, we, we don't see things as they really are in God's sight, we minimize it, it wasn't a big deal, or we just flat out, we don't tell the truth. But what is, what does the scripture say? It says, you know, we're supposed to own up to our sin. Uh, we're to tell the truth. 
in fact, but the Bible also offers us hope and, and, and amazing grace that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We don't get, God doesn't punish us for confessing our sins. He actually forgives us when we confess our sins and put our faith in Christ. That's how incredible God is. Because he already knows what we've done. When, when God said to, to the man, what have you done? Or where are you? Of course God knows. He's omniscient. He knows everything. They're just trying, he's trying to see whether, are they going to confess or are they going to try to minimize it, dodge it, blame someone else? Uh, con and then the, the next one is, I've titled it, because there's three things happening. Consequences, consequences, consequences. Um, for, for the devil, it speaks about enmity between the seed of the woman uh, and the seed of the serpent. Now that introduces a really big topic that flows through the rest of the scripture. But there's a, there's a, a word, that's a, a phrase that the serpent's head will be crushed. It's ultimately a prophecy that's pointing to Jesus who triumphs over Satan. But the, and then there's talked about the, the, the snake crawling on its belly. There's also the whole why do you hate snakes kind of thing that comes out of there. Um, that, so we see there's consequences. We also see there's, I found a picture of a woman in labor. So there you go. <laughs> um, it says pain in childbearing and then problems in marriage. That's part of our being sinful um, and trying to figure out how, how do we make marriage work. And it takes a lot of work and it takes the Holy Spirit and it takes the commitment to Christ on our parts. Um, and then there's the, from dust you are, you know, I, I, a sidebar, at funerals, the funeral director, they don't announce it in a loud voice, they always whisper in your ear if you're the funeral, if you're the person doing the funeral, they always whisper, would you like me to use sand? So, you know, the casket's there, and they have in their pocket, they have this little vial of sand, and they, they like to, they pour it out, they always make it nice, like a little cross or something, but... What, what it really is, is there's a saying that goes with it. From dust you are, into dust you will return. And I always say, oh, no thank you. I always say, why do I say no thank you? Because I know it's a curse. Right? God said, you have rebelled against me. From dust you are, into dust you will return. And if someone says, what's the meaning of the sand? Well, that is a good question, isn't it? <laughs> Sand is God announced judgment for your rebellion against him, and death comes to everyone. Um, but I don't know if that's the best time to have that conversation <laughs> <laughs> at the graveside. So I always just say, oh, no thank you, and then I, I, I try to talk and share with the family. But people don't realize that's what the dust and sand thing is all about. It's a reminder that God put out a penalty for our sin, um, and the penalty is death. And God said, you, if you rebel against me, you will die. Now, like I mentioned last week, you would think that would be enough of a deterrent, right? You know, we, we say, uh, you can say to your kid, don't touch those cookies or you'll be suspended for a week, right? God says, don't, don't eat of the tree. The biggest deterrent you can give to say how important it is and how, how, what holiness is all about is the penalty is death. And like I said, Satan, who's a master at deception. Um, now, there's, a, there's an interesting sidebar. The woman, it says, was deceived. She knew the rules. She even added to the rules, which is interesting. Um, she, and, and, and Satan says Satan deceived her. But Adam, he, or the man, wasn't deceived at all. Which is an interesting thing to think about. His rebellion was wide-eyed. I'm going to go down this road, and there's no deception on his part at all. It's wide, eyes wide open rebellion against God. That's a bad thing. Um, and, and then we think, why do we all die today? Because those are our first parents. We die because, we're in, because we come from them. And so we're born in sin, needing a savior. But there is some great news, and I'll leave you with the great news this morning. Um, oh, actually, but before we get that, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed. There's two lines and there's two kingdoms that are in this passage, and it plays out through the rest of the scriptures. There's, a, there's those who are the children of God, there's those who are the children of the devil, 
there, there is two lines between your seed and her seed. It, it explains there's a, there's a basis for the two kingdoms that we see and the conflict that we see between them today. I don't have time to go any deeper into that. <laughs> go on, Scott. Um, ah, I, want to, I want us to finish here with every book of the Bible, every passage of the Bible, in some way is taking us to Jesus. And that's really good for us. Genesis 3.15, in the midst of judgment, if you want to say, is God gracious? Is God loving? Yes, he is. He said, here's a consequence. And he's serious about it, because he's serious about holiness. He's serious about righteousness. Um, but he also says, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. It's a reference to Christ. There's going to be one that comes from the woman uh, who ultimately will triumph over the devil. And that's Jesus. The passage, it takes us to Jesus. So in, on the worst day ever, and it really is the worst day ever. There's no worse day than the day that we rebelled against God and brought all the problems that exist today. But on the worst day ever, it actually points to the best day ever. Is that because we deserve it? Absolutely not. It's God's grace. God had a plan that we might be reconciled to him. And the plan is fulfilled in the person of Christ who dies on the cross takes the punishment that we deserve so that we can have peace with God. And so, God is good. We're bad. But he has provided a way for us to be forgiven and to be right with him. And you know, as Christians, one of the amazing things is, is the Bible calls us saints. And so we say, okay, Lord, help me to follow you from my heart because I have an incredible gift. I've been pronounced righteous in Christ. I'm a sinner saved by grace. And so I help me, Lord, to follow you from my heart. Help me to live for you. Help me to hold up my faith. Help me to say no to what I need to say no to and say yes to the things of God that I might live for him and please him. Let's sing our closing song this morning.